Good afternoon guys, what is up? I hope you're having an awesome day. This is gonna be a little bit different to a lot of my previous videos. This is more gonna be a recap with a whole bunch of talking and everything else as well, just in case you have an overheating FD. I, for a short period of time, and by short in the FD world, that's like six to 12 months. <laughs> for around six months, I think I had the worst overheating FD here in Australia. And uh, I tried a whole bunch of different things to try and make that work. So if you guys have found this video, I guess you also have an overheating at 13B, overheating rotary of any description, overheating FD, who knows? Over the past six months, I have learned basically as much as humanly possible what to do when these things are overheating. I'm gonna try and give you guys as much information as humanly possible to try and help you guys out. And, uh, and try and keep your 12A, 13B, 20B, 26B, who knows, whatever the hell you have, try and keep that nice and healthy. So a bit of a recap, I bought my FD, uh, this beautiful 2000 model Series 8 uh, RS, a few months ago, probably about six months ago so now, uh, and ever since then I have had a terrible overheating issue where I could not drive for longer than 10 minutes, and mind you it was here in Australia, it was on like 20 or something degree days, so it wasn't overly hot, it wasn't overly cold, but 10 minutes of driving and this thing, as soon as it basically got into traffic, started sitting behind a car just driving on the road we would have horrible overheating issues and so I tried a whole bunch of things to try and sort that out so yeah let's have a bit of a chat about it. so there is no denying it keeping an FD or any rotary cool is the number one thing that you have to do if you own one the two rotor itself consists of eight very important seals that seal off the combustion chamber and the coolant basically port around the entire housing itself. Now a lot of you guys have probably watched like 13B blown up compilations by now trying to figure out your overheating issues and you would have seen horrible white smoke coming out the back of it, you would have seen a whole bunch of different things. That is what happens when your coolant seals fail. When a coolant seal fails it basically just bleeds off coolant into the combustion chamber. The combustion chamber obviously turns that, well, water into gas and then that expels it out the exhaust. So basically, as soon as you start your car up, you'll see a horrible big plume of white smoke come out the back of your car. That is what happens when you have blown a coolant seal. Now what causes a coolant seal to go? Now that could be a magnitude of different things, but the main thing is overheating your rotary. Now I have scoured the internet to try and find safe operating ranges for rotaries, and I have found a mixture of different results, and it's really weird. About 10 years ago, I had a look over forums and everything else as well, where a lot of people were saying that running uh, your rotary up to 100 degrees was completely fine, 105 is where you started to you know, calm it down a little bit, and then 110 is where you start to worry a little bit. Um, nowadays, I have basically gone all through Facebook and a lot of people have told me, you're not really meant to run these things up above anywhere over 95 to 100. Um, and people have said that safe operating ranges are 85 to 88 and then under that is basically okay anything from 71 to 88 you're pretty much fine and that's a usable operating range so there has been a mixture of different things that I have found so um, the most common thing that I have found is that a usable range on a hot day in one of these cars usually when you have the aircon on and everything else as well you might be sitting in traffic and it might be creeping up in temperature anything from 85 to 90 is a usable range in today's sort of rotaries and the way that they're built and the way that the coolant seals and everything. Yeah, I, that, that's all I've been able to find on the internet. Now, not only that, I have seen a video by Race Only where they took it out on the track. Their car was running completely fine at 100 degrees up to 102 and back down to 98, depending on whether they were like in a straight or a twisty section or... Yeah, that's what I found is 85 to 90 is a usable range on a hot day. And from anywhere from 70 to 85 on a cool day is pretty good. Like, you, you're usually pretty good. Um, anything above 90, definitely beware. I would try and cool the car down as quickly as you humanly can. If you're sitting in traffic, see if you can take a back road or something where you can get a bit of free, free flowing air. Um, anything above 95 to 100, I would dare say pull over, let the car cool down, or run it for a little bit, let it cool down, and then come back to it when it reaches back down to that 85 level and then continue on your way. Um, that's all I've been told, that's what I've followed, and so yeah, um, mind you, I do live in Australia though, so um, when I first had this car, uh, the first week that I owned it, I kept trying to drive it around, seeing if I could bleed up the system, seeing if I could fix a whole bunch of things, and I 
twice. So temps above uh, above 100 degrees Celsius, and that. Uh, it scared me a lot. <laughs> so first of all, what do you do if your rotary does reach a temperature that you do not want? You definitely don't want to quickly try and pour water over the engine to try and cool that engine down. You want to just leave it be. If it goes over any certain degree that you want, you want to turn the car off and let it cool down naturally. The coolant itself will actually boil inside the block anywhere up to like 120 to 130 degrees and sometimes. So you just want to leave the car to cool down naturally. If you try to cool it down forcefully, you can end up cracking, uh, end up cracking metal, whether it be housings, whether it be uh, your plates, who knows, uh, but yeah, I could imagine it's probably not a good thing and this is basically the first thing that anyone told me is if you do have an overheating rotary, do not cool down your car just by pouring water on the block. It doesn't work. Would it really be a block? It'd be like housings and... So when mine was first happening, I started to notice a little bit of white smoke on startup. Now I was reassured that this is completely fine. Bridge ports do smoke a little bit on startup, mainly white smoke. Um, I'm unsure why at this point, but yeah, this is all I've been told. So so if you do think your seals are going, you do have a bridge port and it is emitting white smoke, don't stress too much. And that will go away after the first couple of minutes of running, especially when it gets up to 10. So before I jump into the different cooling setup types in your FD or any rotary basically in general, we can have a look at some other little fixes that maybe you can have a look at. First of all being your thermostat. If your thermostat is either one stuck closed or two stuck open, you might be able to see like issues with cooling too much or overheating. You definitely want to be replacing your thermostat. Sometimes you can even go with a aftermarket replacement which actually drops the degree in which the thermostat opens. Me personally, I went from the 82 degree standard thermostat, um, which I don't know whether it even changed in the past or I'm not quite sure, but we went with a billion at 71 degree and that has certainly helped. Um, when I was trying to figure out the overheating issues with the car, I definitely found that that was a great addition to this car um, and it helped me run the car for maybe two or three minutes longer before I just got up to temp anyway and heat soaked it and did all things weird and stuff. Now the second thing you can have a look at is checking that your water pump pulley is actually spinning on the belt, whether it's tight enough or anything along those lines. Now, this was a thing that I never actually went to look at. Um, it's certainly something that you guys picked up on on the videos, but I didn't see it whatsoever, and it is certainly something that has helped fix my car. So, the water pump pulley uh, normally comes a little bit smaller than this. This is one that my friend has lent me, and I have to give it back to him, actually, because I got a pack performance one. Um, but going with an oversized water pump pulley is certainly a great addition. Usually, they have like a little bit of a texture on the outside of the pulley, which will help grip the belt a little bit. They'll come with an extra belt and everything else as well if you get a decent kit. But what these actually do is they increase the circumference circumference of your water pump pulley. So instead of having a smaller pulley, in which case it's having more load on the actual pulley itself, they get these bigger ones, which in turn will slow your water pushing potential. <laughs> that will slow the water pushing down, um, the water pumping down, and um, you'll get a more consistent flow. Uh, it won't cultivate as much. And also this won't have as much load, so it won't slip. That is certainly one of the biggest things that we noticed with my FD. Um, so 100%, if you think that this may also be an issue or you just want to go overkill with your cooling setup, definitely get one of these, an oversized water pump pulley. I think you can find them on eBay pretty cheap. If not, Pack Performance has a pretty good kit for it as well. Um, my no expenses spared sort of thing behind me, I really wanted to make sure that I went over and above and make sure the parts work, so I went with the Pack Performance options. The other thing you have to look at is also your turbo versus engine setup and everything along those lines. The previous owner of my car actually went with a Bridgeport setup um, and still has the stock twins in it. Now ideally this is not something I would want to do because what it can do is it can bottleneck the system and the gas and everything. Your EGTs, your exhaust gas temperatures, can skyrocket and this can definitely be a big thing um, when it comes to trying to cool down your FD. Ideally you would want to get something along the lines of either rebuilt twins or a single turbo kit to go with a Bridgeport to try and maximize the potential out of your Bridgeport. Um, a lot of people go for the sound of the bridge port, which is I think what the last owner did. Just wanted to rebuild the engine to get the sound of it. These stock twins um, definitely have a lot going on. There's a lot of vacuum lines, there's a lot of just everything going on down there. There's not as much airflow that's able to get around those two things and it's just a very large clump of metal that just has 
has the potential to get very hot very quickly and it also is a little bit restrictive if you have a bridge port or even some street ports or extended ports or anything like that. Um, it can bottleneck the system, your EGTs can skyrocket. I'm not exactly sure whether this is an issue on my car because I don't have any EGT sensors, um, but I'm unsure, I'm gonna work it out in the future, but I'll work it out when I go single and I actually put some HET sensors in there. Now I believe the fourth thing that's probably going to be right there in your face um, is bleeding the coolant system. Bleeding the coolant system is definitely one of the biggest things you can do properly. It is ultra difficult to try and bleed out rotaries because they just always, they're always just forever changing. Whether you have the AST delete or you still have the air separator tank or who knows, these things are just a pain in the ass to bleed. It can take a number of hours. It can take a number of heat cycles. I've found that jacking up the front of the car, bleeding the car um, and just letting it cool down all the way just to before the thermos that opens and then letting it do that a few times um, sort of makes it or sort of gives it a happy medium uh, where there's no more bubbles in the system. If you're still seeing bubbles in the system after a few times of bleeding, there may be a potential that you might have a failing coolant seal. Um, that could be a potential issue, but because this engine was only like 2000 Ks old when I got it, I refused. I refused to think about my engine being blown up. So I just kept bleeding it and bleeding it and bleeding it. And sure enough, it has paid off. It is fully bled now. Now chatting to Omar down at race only, he let me know a couple of months ago that once your system is bled, you put a cap on, you don't look at it. Because these will actually drop in coolant temp with the air separator tank sitting right there. Um, and it'll actually look like it's using coolant as you're driving it. It doesn't, it, well it does, but it doesn't. Um, you only want to top the car up with coolant when the coolant light comes on on the dash. Because um, it does look like it has used coolant, but trust me, once it gets down to a certain level, it doesn't it doesn't go over that level. Um, so yeah, that'll be if your system is built properly. Um, so yeah. Uh, I just recommend checking it every now and then, just topping it up a little bit and um, yeah, just if your coolant light keeps coming on, then checking it, topping it up, um, so yeah. Alright, so let's have a look at the three different setups you can go, or three main setups you can go with an FD in terms of cooling. You can go with either the stock setup. The stock setup prioritizes the radiator for airflow. You have basically the condenser, yeah, sorry, the condenser, then you have the radiator right behind it, and then you have a smaller radiator, uh, sorry, smaller intercooler right behind that that's about, I don't know, about that wide or so. Beside that, you have the cold air intake, which has a box over it. The intercooler has a box over it. The radiator has its fan shroud right behind it. So it sort of prioritizes the radiator and engine cooling as much as humanly possible. The stock setup is, as I've heard from a lot of people, a completely fine setup for if you don't have any crazy porting done to your engine. Um, the stock twins seem to work great with the stock setup and everything else as well. So if your car's stock setup is working, then I wouldn't stress at all. Because I've never run a stock setup, I don't really know the value points of the stock setup. Um, so yeah, if your stock setup's working, that's great. If you do find you have high IATs, then you certainly can go with a different intercooler that sits just behind the radiator there. I believe Grady and HKS make cool little sort of aftermarket alloy intercoolers that you can put in there. They look pretty cool. Um, but yeah, as for this car right here being a bridge port and still running the stock twins and everything, um, then yeah, that is certainly something you would want to be upgrading from. Now not only that, you can get a whole bunch of radiators that will sit in the stock location, much like the Koyo Enflow radiators. Um, apart from that, I haven't really seen any. Apart from that, there are a few other radiators. I believe Mishimoto does one as well. That will actually sit in that stock place. So if you are overheating with the stock setup, you could potentially look at that as an option as well. Rightio, so the second system that you can go with with cooling your FD is going to the front mount intercooled setup. Now by all means, please, 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 for the love of God, make sure you weigh a little bit and spend the right money on a good front mount intercooler kit. I had a front mount intercooler kit on this car here when I was having those horrible overheating issues. Um, I had a $400 kit from eBay and then it also had a very thick, sort of the cheapest thing that was like a stock relocation sort of radiator um, that was you could buy off eBay. I think it was a full like $800 setup for the radiator and intercooler and everything and it was just woeful. It didn't do anything at all to try and keep this car cool and to be honest, I honestly think the stock setup would have been a lot better than it. I'll quickly grab the radiator. So the radiator itself didn't actually look too bad. It was this massive, big, uh, I believe it was a, like a two or three inch wide uh, alloy radiator and it looked pretty sick. Um, after having a look on eBay, these things retail for around about 
200 to 300 dollars um, and it wasn't the greatest thing in the world. Um, it was a little bit too thick and air was not able to pass through this whatsoever. Now, whether this would have been okay with a different intercooler, I'm not quite sure. I changed both out at the same time. From my own personal experience, I highly recommend staying away from anything, you know, cheap eBay, cheap Craigslist, cheap wherever you are, um, cheap Amazon intercooler and radiator kits because I can almost guarantee that they're gonna do a little bit more harm than good in some, like, in some times, even if they do work well, well, they can have issues in regards to reliability, so just make sure you're spending the money. Um, please do remember that an FD cooling system is not something you want to cheap out on. These cars live for cooling. If they don't cool, they cook, and when they cook, they blow up, and that's when, yeah, that's not a good thing. Some from many cooler brands I have seen that actually have some pretty good results is anything from like Plasma Man here in Australia, um, Koyo Enflow Radiators, uh, once again, uh, a stock fit that seem to be really good with these cars with front mount kits. And don't get me wrong, there are plenty of cars out there with front mount kits that are working perfectly. So if you do have any overheating issues with either the stock setup or anything along those lines, potentially going to a front mount setup may be a good thing or maybe you just want to try and keep those IATs down for track days or just general street driving or anything um, yeah front main intercoolers can be good now there is a few little things about front main intercoolers as well that I have found in the past so you definitely want to be ducting as much as you humanly can when it comes to your front main intercooler to try and get everything you can into your radiator so when it comes to the under tray, some people like to take it out so that way it allows for the air to flow back up and into the radiator. But just remember, air will always take the path of least resistance. So if you're trying to force air up into a certain little area that it doesn't have to go to, the air won't go into there. And that was the issue I think with my old setup was the fact that I had this little under tray and I was trying to scoop up air and do everything. Um, the little scoop that I made definitely helped. Um, I also made a top plate to try and funnel all the air that was coming through the intercooler straight into the radiator and um, all in all that whole system just didn't work. I believe the way that the intercooler was all set up and the way that the radiator was all stationed and everything, um, there was no air that could basically get through the radiator and the fans that I had weren't enough CFM to draw through anything through the radiator when it was getting hot, it was just heat soaking and it was just not playing the game. So once again, as I said guys, cooling is definitely not an area that you want to cheap out on on your FD. If you know that there's a setup that's going to work for your car, definitely go with it. As I said, there are some really good brands out there. Try and get some big brand name products. Don't cheap out on getting an intercooler or a radiator. Ducting is your best friend. Make sure to test it without the under tray or with the under tray because sometimes they can help. As I said guys, there is cars out there that do have front mounts that are working completely fine. So definitely test it out, see how it works for your car. Front mounts look sick, however, I personally like the V-mount. So option number three for calling your FD is going with a V-mount setup. Now the V-mount puts the intercooler at a basically a 45 degree at the very front, um, facing sort of downwards, and then the radiator at a sort of like a 45 facing down. I'll quickly show you what I mean. So looking at the front of the FD right here, you can see that my Greddy radiator is currently sitting at a 45. You can see my condenser, the bent horrible thing in the middle there is sitting uh, basically straight. And then my intercooler is sitting up there also at a 45 and that area there is all blocked off so that way we can get some more air through the condenser and through the radiator as well. Alrighty, so a V-mount is the number one best setup that you can get to cool down an FD. Now do keep in mind that some racetracks, especially some around here in Australia, um, do not allow our V-mount kits to be used. So if you do plan on tracking your car, definitely check up on some of the regulations or governing bodies of tracks may have because they may not even allow you to run a V-mount setup on any car. So the V-mount setup is going to give you your best cooling that you can possibly get for any either FD or just rotary in general. It gives you three main partitions or two partitions if you don't want to run your condenser where air has to go through your intercooler or your radiator or either your condenser or all three and it has to do every single one with fresh air. There is no recirculating air through one radiator through the next, through the next thing. Everything is going to be receiving nice, 
cool, fresh air. So it's going to be giving you pretty similar IATs to what a front mount intercooler kit will do, but it's also prioritizing your radiator and your engine cooling as much as humanly possible. Now there were a few kits around and I was told that Gretti is number one. So that's what I went with my car. I wanted to retain AC. I wanted to retain a whole bunch of stuff. So Gretti was the number one option for me. And plus it's also been around for decades and the system has basically remained unchanged. So I went with the Gretti itself. However, there's a couple of other brands that do some really good stuff. Um, Vinny Fab, Rotary Works, I believe HKS also do a V-mount setup as well. There's a couple of really cool V-mount setups out there. So um, yeah, definitely check them all out. I don't know if there's any cheap V-mount setups where they have cheap cores or anything, but I could imagine that even a cheap V-mount would work with some applications, but, but then you also worry about fitment issues, whether the thing's actually gonna fit in your car. This Gretti kit will not, like, this was the most insane bolt-in kit that I've ever seen in my life. Everything just bolted in flawlessly. Everything was like, the, the only issues I had was issues I already had with my car and the condenser was, was all flexed and everything. Literally, the Gretti kit was the most bolt-in, bolt-in thing that I've ever bought, ever. <laughs> but for the money, being four and a half thousand dollars Australian, um, it is certainly, something you would hope would bolt in to be honest so just to reiterate a few little points the stock setup is a great setup however if you are having any issues with the stock setup you can try a front mount setup just to try and get some cooler iat's but at the end of the day if you were trying to go all out trying to keep this thing cold um then going with a v-mount is definitely the best setup i went from a car that basically will overheat within 10 minutes to a car that i can drive around for hours on end go stop at shops stop at servos stop at anywhere and this thing will jump straight back down to the low to high 70s and basically stay in that range and it has been flawless ever since. And another thing I really want to quickly chuck in on top is going with a vented bonnet. Now the vented bonnet is certainly something that helped out with my cooling immensely. Now in certain states and certain countries, carbon vented bonnets aren't legal. However, I don't mind running this because basically it has saved my car. It has already certainly paid for itself. Um, it is an absolutely brilliant addition. You can see just how much heat comes out of that engine bay. It is immense. And not only that, it's also allowing everything that comes in and then goes through the intercooler straight up and over the engine and straight out. Hot air rises, it is basically just letting everything go out. When you're cruising around, this thing just sucks air out of it. It is brilliant. So I definitely recommend getting either an 89 or one of TJ Hunt's new sort of street fighter things or uh, the SP bonnets or anything that just allows for good cooling in your FD or anything that just has massive big vents to allow hot air to escape. All right, so now we get to the not fun part of what if you can't keep it cold? So if you're trying to bleed the system and you do find that the bubbles are endless, big bubbles, small bubbles, when you turn the car off there's bubbles and it's just boiling the system up immensely, it could mean that you have a damaged coolant seal and that could mean that it is pressurizing or the, the combustion is pressurizing the cooling system and that's where it's creating these bubbles like boiling the system and then yeah pushing bubbles up for when you're trying to bleed it um, this is certainly something that you don't want and that could be a recall now if you start your car up and it's creating thick white smoke that basically could be a few little things um, it could be a blown turbo you don't know um, if your seals fail on a turbo that could possibly be it um, but if you're having overheating issues at the same time then most likely it is going to be your seals if you can't stop it from creating white smoke then your seals may have collapsed or broken down or anything and it is leaking coolant into the combustion chamber going out the exhaust and that is a rebuild in itself as well once again guys I do want to reiterate that keeping a rotary cool is the biggest thing you can do to try and save the life of these cars they will run perfectly fine no worries at all as long as you have no detonation as long as you're lubing those apex seals and as long as you're keeping them cool so don't cheap out on any of those three things and uh, I hope today has helped you a little bit and I hope this video has helped you out a little bit if you do have anything you want to add in the comments please do add little fixes that you've found to try and combat your overheating issues in your rotary or if you just have any questions in general about this car please do leave it in the comments I'm sorry if it was a little bit boring but hopefully I've helped you out a little bit definitely check all the things that I've said in this video I went through basically everything on this car before I spent the four and a half thousand dollars on this V-mount um, 
all in all, I just went overkill. Also, I wanna add that the stock thermos are great fans. Um, if you can keep the stock thermos, I 100% try to recommend it. Um, a lot of people, street driving and track driving, all prefer stock thermos. Um, I'm pretty sure there was a difference in the Series 6 and then the Series 7 and up. Um, RX-7s to the different thermos and then RX-8 electric thermos are also great as well. I'm pretty sure there's a, a, as a general number you want at least 2200 CFM combined with your fans and your radio setup and everything else as well. The fans that I have in the car at the moment are great for the V-mount but they weren't great for the stock location of the radiator, they just couldn't pull enough through. Um, so definitely making sure that you're getting some good high-end thermos if you are going to some aftermarket thermos or just sticking with the stock ones. If you can fit them, they work brilliantly. Yeah, hey, first of all, I'm not trying to be someone I'm not. But there's plenty different ways for you to go and get your props. You don't need to try pretending living lifestyles you ain't got. That's that shit I told myself when I was low and feeling lost. Learning lessons, pay the cost while they watching Hugo Boss.